Good afternoon, everyone. I am really excited to be one of your speakers for today. So quickly, just by a quick show of hands, how many of you are concerned or worried about the quality of air you breathe? Okay, I can see a few hands. Oh, that's like about 70% of the room. Okay. <laughs> um, I think we can just do like a really quick exercise, just a little exercise. If we can just all take in a really deep breath, like breathe in as deep as you can go. <laughs> and out. That was relaxing, right? Okay. So air pollution. Air pollution, both indoor and outdoor, is a problem that's present in most parts of the world. What is air pollution, one might ask? S to simply put it, it's contaminated air. It's contaminated air that can affect the human health, it can affect all the living things in the environment, it can affect the climate and our built environments, which include our structures and um, buildings and other structures we have outdoor. Um, an American comedy writer wrote, um, said, um, wrote um, a statement saying that there's so much pollution in the air now that it would, um, it, if it weren't for our lungs, that there will be no place to put it all. That might sound funny, but that statement is not far from the truth. This is because air pollution is a key global environmental health risk. It's actually the fourth main risk factor for, for preventable deaths and um, disabilities globally. So that little exercise we took right at the start, where we took in a very deep breath, that air could actually be polluted, and breathing in polluted air is very dangerous to our health. Air pollution kills. Air pollution has killed more people than malaria, road traffic accidents, and AIDS. In 2019 alone, approximately 6.7 million deaths were linked to exposure to air pollution. Just in a single year, 6.7 million preventable deaths were linked to air pollution. And this air pollution comprises of both the indoor and outdoor air pollution. So looking at indoor air pollution, indoor air pollution is a major problem, mainly in low-income countries, and um, about two point, approximately 2.6 million people across the world, are, 2 billion people across the world are actually exposed to indoor air pollution. And 2.6 billion, that's quite a large number, and one would say, one would actually want to think about what the likely causes of indoor air pollution might be. Cooking. Now, you've seen, you can see that picture. We have a really nice burner. We've got a nice pot. We've got a wooden spoon on it. You might, some people might actually be thinking, what am I going to make for my afternoon meal or my evening meal? And how can that burner, a nice looking pot and a wooden spoon, how can cooking with that actually cause indoor air pollution? It sure does, but that's not the kind of cooking I'm focused on. It's this kind of cooking where millions of people across the world, ten, millions of people across the world in low-income countries tend to use um, open stoves and tend to use open fire and stoves which are fueled by the burning of biomass, um, kerosene, coal, and even cow dung to make their meals. Don't get me wrong, cooking is not the only source of indoor air pollution. We've got um, heating, we've got poor ventilation, we've got chemicals, we've got pesticides, even in offices, We've got um, like um, inks, printers, and the likes. The list just keeps going on and on about some of the likely causes of indoor air pollution. Now, if we move away from indoor air pollution now into outdoor air pollution, in 2019, still our favorite year of 2019, just before the COVID, the World Health Organization proposed that 99% of the world's population actually reside in places that exceed the air quality standard, air quality guideline levels which the World Health Organization actually proposes for human exposure to air pollution. 99%, that's literally everywhere on planet Earth. But then, millions of deaths are linked to air pollution, but a significant number of those deaths are attributed to outdoor air pollution. And the World Health Organization also, also proposes that about 91% of those premature deaths that are associated with outdoor air pollution actually occur in low and middle income countries. Now, we're still seeing our low income countries still on 
the list of countries that suffer quite a lot. There are a wide range of sources of outdoor air pollution. There are the natural sources, and then we've got the man-made. Some of the natural sources are um, the likes of our dust storms and um, forest fires. Then we've also got the man-made one, the man-made ones, which are quite significant. Um, some of the sources range from emissions from our cars. I know a good number of us might have driven down to the TEDx today. <laughs> so we've got emissions from cars, we've got open burning of waste, we've got agriculture, we've got industrial emission. One that really stick close to me is the emissions from heat and power generation. In my home country back in Nigeria, electricity is something that is kind of like an issue, so you tend to see most household own generator sets just to produce power or electricity in their houses. I know my mom, she's got three generators back home. She's got a little one which she uses during the daytime just to, for light and maybe a fan. And then she's got a bigger one she uses at night which could carry her fridge and everything she's got. And then she's got a third one which is like the backup generator just in case the, f the, the first one is bad or the second one is bad. And it's not just my mom. I mean, if you speak to a good number of Nigerians, you would find out that a lot of them do own generator sets back home. And it's not just peculiar in Nigeria. I think other countries across Africa as well, and maybe some part of South Asia, also use LM generators to power, um, provide power for their houses. Air pollution actually composes of um, a lot of pollutants, but there are some pollutants that actually have showed the strongest evidence when you, when you, um, in relation to the adverse effects that air pollution has on the human health. And some of those um, pollutants are the particulate matter, which are the PM um, 2.5 and PM 10, which is particles with um, aerodynamic um, diameter of, um, aerodynamic um, diameter with um, aero. <laughs> aerodynamic diameter that is equal to or less than 2.5 micrometers and 10 micrometers. And then we've also got the nitrogen dioxide and sulfur dioxide. And then we've also got ozone and carbon monoxide. Numerous studies across the world have actually documented how these pollutants affect human health. And we can see that um, in, when it comes to difficulty in breeding for um, individuals with asthma and, all, and other for individuals with also other forms of breeding um, illnesses as well. We can also see that there have been, document, been documentations of how air pollution affects children. I know a, lot of some, uh, a handful of us here might have kids, how air pollution might affect our children. Even infants, newborn, Air pollution, there have been documentation to show that, air, there have been studies to document that air pollution should us affect infants. And then elderly people in society as well, there have been rise in hospital cases with elderly, um, pay, um, elderly people presenting with um, lung and um, heart diseases. Air pollution has been linked to quite a number of illnesses and um, um, diseases ranging from stroke to obesity, um, to obesity to diabetes, lung, um, lung cancer. The list just keeps going on and on and on. And then, armed with all of this information about what air pollution is, what it does to the human health, one might just want to stop for a moment and just pause. And then you think about what is in the air that we breathe in our homes, in our schools, in our offices, on our streets. Thinking about that and you actually realize that breathing polluted air has slowly, over time, become a public health hazard. And that's pretty scary because air pollution, it kills. Air pollution undermines our well-being and it affects us all. Usually, people tend to ignore air pollution because we don't see it with our physical eyes. Most times you don't get to see it with your physical eyes, so you just ignore it. But then I can actually tell you that in some parts of the world, like I always use my home country as a very quick example, in Nigeria, there have been instances where air pollution was very visible to our naked eyes. We could actually see it with our physical eyes. A couple of months ago, over the spring break, I traveled to Nigeria to visit family after almost three months of being away. And one thing that actually struck me the most was the fact that when I, whenever I stepped out into the streets, the first thing that would hit me was the poor air quality. 
the air was so poor, it was dense. And when I looked around, people, people were moving about on the streets, going about their day-to-day -day activities. And I wondered where they're not concerned about the poor air quality, the fact that the, the cars in traffic were emitting so much pollutants into the atmosphere. The generator sets that were being used by small businesses on the streets were actually pack, emitting so much into the air and everyone just kept going about their day-to-day -day activity. I just had to take a step back and just go with the flow. I wouldn't say I ignored it at that point in time, but I just had to put that at the part of my mind, despite my knowledge and awareness of what both the short and long-term exposure to air pollution could do to my health and to the human body. And the fact that there could be so much level of pollution present in most of the cities I visited at that point, at that um, break I had over the spring. Barry Common, one of the founders of modern, um, one of the founders of modern environmental movements, said that air pollution is not merely a nuisance. Air pollution is not merely a nuisance and a threat to health. It is a reminder that our most celebrated technological advancements, the automobile, the jet planes, the power plant, industry in general, and indeed modern society itself, um, itself are in the environment failures. In more, just sum that quote up, air pollution actually sits in the very heart of human activity. Air pollution sits in the very heart of human activity. The air we breathe is slowly killing people. And the story of air pollution is not being told, is not being adequately told globally, especially in developing countries. And this makes me fear for the future. This makes me worry a lot about the future. Air pollution has actually been killing people. It has and is still killing millions of people every single year across the world. And the fact that we're, it's astonishing that air pollution is not, we're not talking about air pollution non-stop. If it kills people that much, we should be talking about it. It should be at the forefront of everything. It should be at the forefront of a lot of the things we do. It should be at the forefront of conversations. But it's sad to see that that is not the story across the world. Air pollution is a problem that cannot be eradicated. Air pollution cannot be stopped, but rather it can be controlled it can be minimized, and it can be managed. Controlling, managing, and minimizing air pollution are the ways that we could reduce the adverse effect of air pollution. And this is where data and data analytics comes in. Air quality levels, or should I say air pollution levels, should be measured continuously. Air pollution levels should be measured on a daily basis, on a weekly basis, on a monthly basis, should measure it continuously to be able to find the trends and the patterns that exist in air pollution variations. Air pollution should be measured continuously to be able to identify and pinpoint um, sources of air pollution. And when these um, sources of air pollution are being found, you address those, the pollution source rather than addressing the consequences of air pollution. With that being said, in a, lot of developing in a lot of developed countries, air pollution is actually being measured and monitored, um, has been measured and monitored for quite a number of years now. And one of the common themes that is consistent when you look at um, um, clean air measures that have been implemented in countries that have been monitoring air pollution is comprehensive data. Data has always been at the forefront of managing air pollution threats. Not just air pollution, data has actually been at the forefront of managing literally anything, any sector, anything across the world. Data has always been at the forefront. Data analytics helps to, pre um, it helps to predict the consequences of air pollution, and then it helps to make data different decisions when coming up with strategies to minimize air pollution, when it comes to strategies to minimizing the damages that are associated with this um, pandemic. Despite all of the significant progress that countries have made over the years in Managing air pollution still remains a problem. So 
one could ask, oh, we spend, countries spend millions of, millions and millions of amount of money, dollars, pounds, and whatever currency you have to manage this situation, but it still remains a problem. But the one thing that we should not fail to understand is that air pollution, it sits at the very, very, very heart of human activity. As population grows, so will, this, so will our human activities grow. And when, this human activity, when, our, when the human activities grow, air pollution also increases as well. So managing it, so that's where, the, that's where you need to understand the fact that it's a continuous process. It just doesn't stop because growth is something that is inevitable in life. So my, when it comes to, despite the fact that we know all of this and it still remains a problem, we don't just stop because you, when you're solving a problem and you're not seeing results, you don't just stop. It's a continuous process, so you have to keep going. There are century more, there, there have been um, measures that have been put in place. From, so a quick example that comes to mind are the um, sensor network that um, are, okay, the sensor networks that are um, quite common in the, some developed countries have sensor um, networks that they use to um, generate data. Uh, they need to generate data. They have sensor networks. They've got machine learning algorithms that produce real-time data that are reliable across different cities and not um, across different cities. And they also visualize data, they also visualize air pollution as well, in the sense that one could actually see the part, if you live in a city, you could actually see the part of a city that actually has the highest level of pollution. And then you could also see the part of the city where you have clean air as well. So data and analytics is actually the future for, is actually key to an effective future when it comes to managing air pollution. I decided not to go into details about the whole analytic process, not to get people bored with the discussion, well, not to get all of you bored with the discussion, but just to pass across the point that data actually helps to inform and influence decisions, policies, and mitigation strategies, and this has actually led to excellent results. Some of the big multinational companies we have across the world, like Google, Amazon, Microsoft, Samsung, these companies have actually used, these companies have actually, over the years, achieved remarkable success because they've used data, to, they've, they've gathered and analyzed data to help make decisions, that have, to help make data-driven decisions that have actually helped their businesses over years. They've turned these um, data into actionable insights. Cities, countries and cities have actually been doing this over the years, but then you don't just stop, you have to keep going because a strong reminder, air pollution cannot be eradicated, it cannot be stopped, it can only be managed, and when, we keep, when data is being collected, and when you, the collection and utilization of air quality data to make informed decision has been and will continue to result, that uh, will continue to um, result in better ways to, in better ways, to, in, uh, will continue to result in a better way of life for us all. I just want to close with the point with um, a quote by um, Ronald Coase, who said that if we torture the data long enough, it will confess. If we continue, if we continue to dig into the data, we continue to look, um, look at air quality data to actually help us to make informed decisions to manage this pandemic that we've been plagued with. Thank you.